Let's talk now about interest rates and I guess how to position your portfolio in this kind of environment when we are seeing dovish central banks and the expectation uh, that interest rates will be cut because the RBA could cut the cash rate below its current record low of 1.5%. It comes as interest rates globally look set to stay near record lows for the foreseeable future. Given the current environment, how should you be positioning your portfolio? Well, Marcus Bogdan from Blackmore Capital joins us live from our Melbourne studio just to give us his thoughts and analysis on this topic. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time today. As we made mention there, I guess for so long, you've, we've almost been with this expectation that central banks will have our backs. Even though there's been headwinds around, you know, there's been talk that they would step in with stimulus and that's kind of driven markets higher here. With more and more talk now of, of interest rate cuts, how do investors source a share portfolio that provides attractive and sustainable dividend income? Good morning, Leanne. I think you're absolutely right. It is about sustainable dividends. Central banks have been incredibly accommodative of equ equity markets, and it's also refocused uh, attention back on good dividend yielding shares. We would categorise it under sort of three core headings. Prima facie, high dividend yielding stocks above 5%. Uh, we still like things like ANZ, Commonwealth Bank, and, and transurban. We believe that those dividends are sustainable. Um, but look, let's get back to our discussion here with Marcus Bogdan about where to invest in this low interest rate environment. Marcus, I'm sorry for the interruption there. Perhaps you can just uh, kick it off again with what you were saying there about where you should be positioning yourself. I think you were talking about some of the major banks there. Um, what is your view, I guess, on, on where to go and do you still look at the major banks as, as yield plays? Yes, I think you've got to be careful in looking at the major banks and we would categorise both um, ANZ and Commonwealth um, Bank um, very well capitalised, uh, reasonable uh, dividend payout ratios. We believe that they can um, can generate sustainable dividends and, and over sort of five to six percent going going forward. And that's compared to, to NAB, where I think um, your commentators earlier, I think there is a real risk that that dividend can be rebased. So that's one area is high yielding dividend companies which, and you're absolutely right in underlying, they have to be sustainable. The second area that we like are the companies with strong earnings growth, because strong earnings growth translates into strong dividend growth. And so we like companies like Clean Away Waste Management, where we're able to increase their dividend by 50% in the first half result. Macquarie Bank is another example of, of strong earnings and that's reflected in, in higher dividends. And the third area that we like is companies that are very cash generative uh, that, and, and have low leverage. Companies like BHP, Rio, Woodside uh, are generating a lot of cash at the moment. They're moderating their capital expenditure um, uh, performance and then they're also they're also with low with low leverage and they've got the ability to pay back dividends and and and, and do capital management for investors so they're the three areas that, that we like and we also like the thematic of good dividend yielding companies that are able to to um, to use capital management and over time empirical studies have shown that that's one of the best areas to get um, strong dividend growth growth going forward. What about the really real estate investment trusts or the REITs? Because they are often looked at, aren't they, as, um, as strong dividend plays. They have had a phenomenal run, though, I guess, with um, you know, some of the volatility around in markets. I mean, people have been ploughing into those REIT stocks. Do you think they've kind of, they're, they're sort of right at the top and, and therefore you wouldn't look at them because there's not an expectation that we'll see that, that same kind of earnings growth and therefore dividend growth? What, what, what's your view broadly on those REITs? Yeah, we broadly think that the REITs are now uh, fully priced and almost mm -hmm. o overvalued. And you look at sort of price to book, uh, the, the way that the dividend yield has come, come down as, as prices ha have, go have gone up. And they're also reasonably geared. And so slow growth, high, high gearing, we would definitely favour more industrial companies that can, or healthcare companies that can deliver good earnings growth. And another area which ha has, uh, has gone up significantly on this dividend yield play has been sort of infrastructure and utility companies. And, and we see that area as, as been overbought as well at mm -hmm. this point in time.
Look, I mean, the market in general has had such a strong rise, not just the Australian share market, but global markets. I mean, many of them have sort of notched up double digit returns for, for 2019. Um, we were talking a little earlier with a previous guest and he was sort of saying it's like watching paint dry at the moment, though, because we're in this really tight yeah. trading range. We don't seem to be moving in either direction with some of those headwinds like the Fed or trade, US reporting season, of course, now our own federal election coming up. So kind of stuck in, the, in this trading range. But that's not to say that we've had a really, really great run up in, in 2019. So with markets at around these levels and the, the, the good gains that we've seen, what is your kind of equity investment approach that you would take right now? Sure. I think at this st stage of the cycle and where the market's at, you, you need to be far more discerning in your stock selection. You need to be patient. In the Australian market now on a Ford PE is around 15 and a half times, which is about 10 per cent above its long term average. And so that's suggesting, with, especially with slowing earnings growth, that you need to be very careful at this point in time. And so we're very much focused on, on high quality companies that, that are able to generate reoccurring earnings and have got strong balance sheets. I think that's from, from our perspective where, where the emphasis needs to be. And also we've used this, this, this recent rally to increase our cash levels to around 15 to 18 per cent because we do want to reinvest back in those, into those com com companies if markets uh, do soften in, in, into the future. Mm. What about having exposure to some of those US earnings? Um, you know, you think of a Brambles, for example, where it's got obviously a large operation in the US, across the globe, actually, mm -hmm. in Europe and, and the Asia Pacific. I mean, yeah. it's had a pretty good run up, um, you know, encouraging momentum in recent times. What's your view? Is it, this one is one that you like in particular, isn't it? I mean, you look at that chart, it looks pretty good over the course of the year. Do you think that momentum will yes, remain? It Yes, it, uh, yes it, the, the chart does look quite, quite good, but I think it, it reflects the, what is actually happening in the company. And the fundamentals mm. on earnings, and you're absolutely right, their biggest business is in the US. Um, I've recently returned from the US uh, where we saw a number of users and customers and competitors to Brambles. And what we, we heard on the ground was quite encouraging. They were able to, to increase prices to offset the, sort of the cost pressures that you're seeing in, in transport and, and, and lumber. They're winning new contracts from either existing um, customers or, or from new, new customers. And their most recent result, their update on their third quarter, quarter uh, sales revenue uh, was generating 7% constant, um, uh, constant currency growth, which is phenomenal given that these developed economies are growing between sort of 1% and 2%. Two, two so we still think it's, um, it's, a, it's a significant holding. It's a core blue chip holding in our portfolio. And the additional um, element is that they've just sold IFCO. And once that, once that deal is settled, um, they'll be using the uh, 2.5 billion US dollars uh, for capital management with, with, a, uh, with a buyback, a special dividend and, and paying down debt. And all of those elements we, we still find attractive at, at, at even at these levels. Mm. What about an Amcor? Is this one that you watch? There's been a bit of news around. Of course, it is uh, still awaiting antitrust approval for that five billion US dollar acquisition of, of Bemis. Um, and today, there's a bit of news about them selling their two US packaging plants and a stake in a third to Pecniplex. And that's obviously in a bid to, to get the deal over the line there with Bemis. There's been a lot of M&A activity, but uh, Amcor certainly one that we are watching. Obviously, does now have that exposure to the US as well. Is is that one that uh, that you watch closely? Yes, we, we, we watch it closely. We currently mm. don't, don't own it mm -hmm. um, and we're always cautious ahead of very large acquisitions mm. because generally they're, they're more, more complex. Uh, Bemis is a, is a lower returning business uh, than, than Amcor. But notwithstanding that, I mean, a Amcor's pedigree, its position in its, in its core markets is significant and it's, it is one that we are watching mm. carefully and on, on price weakness, um, we, would, we would consider it quite seriously. All right, excellent. Look, I think we might wrap up the discussion there, Marcus, but it's been a real pleasure. We uh, appreciate you joining us today. We'll look forward to talking again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Leanne.